afternoon, everyone. You all okay? Good. Sorry to have kept you. Um, I'm actually going to have to blame uh, Quajo over there for that. Um, as you'll notice, because he's a young chap, he doesn't wear a watch. Um, so his timekeeping is all over the place. It's true, I do apologise. <laughs> um, so it is, uh, is entirely his fault. Um, us, us older people who stick to time were here well ahead of time, but, you know, it's you. Yeah, that's... Buy a watch now. That's, yeah, go, go and buy a watch. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's something more trendy than that, hopefully. But, um, you've got phones. The phone, mm. has, phone tells the time. I know, I don't really have an excuse to go on Yeah, there is no excuse. Anyway, we're here. Um, uh, do you like the tie, by the way? It's the only one you'll see on the panel today, because uh, um, I've made an effort. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't expect you to wear a tie. Um, is that, that I must tell you, it's actually um, homemade. Um, uh, it looks like a carpet, but uh, it's made knitted knitted by my wife, who is a very good knitter, and I rather like it. It's getting its debut today because you're special people, and you have paid to be here. So let's not disappoint you. So um, the the session, of course, today is is all about housing. Um, I think the background here in Scotland... By the way, who is not from Scotland? Living in, living in Scotland counts. Yeah, so who doesn't live in Scotland? Most of you do live in Scotland. OK, so we've got quite a, a different scene here in Scotland to the one that uh, Quajo experiences. Um, you do live in London, don't you? Yeah, Croydon. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Croydon. Yeah. Right. I have no idea where Croydon is. <laughs> I think L London generally. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so, you know, as, as most of you will know, um, housing uh, is devolved, i.e. it's uh, completely the responsibility of the Scottish government and, and councils. Um, so we have quite a different scene to the one that Quajo experiences. But I'm really interested to hear what he's got to say because he's written a book there's the book and afterwards if you like what he's got to say um, he will sign copies of it for you uh, but you have to buy it of course um, there are I, I bought this um, it, is, it is a good read um, mainly because it's got big writing um, which suits me uh, but it's, no, I recommend it so if you like what you hear today please go and buy the book and Quajo will sign it um, don't don't run off. And go I won't. I won't. I'll stuff. be here. I'll be yeah. here. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, so to our panel, it's not just about uh, Quajo. We've got um, a couple of other very very good speakers. Um, Alison Watson from Shelter Scotland, um, and I think I'll open with Alison uh, and Professor Ken Gibb, who is an expert on all things housing, uh, in, mainly in Scotland, but writes of writes lots of academic tomes but don't, please don't sound like an academic when you're talking to our audience Ken because uh, it'll be over my head and it might be over theirs but let's keep it down to earth so I think I think what we'll do uh, is if I I will kick off by asking some general questions of our panel I didn't introduce myself did I no. you didn't you didn't say anything right so I'm Graham Simpson uh, MSP for Central Scotland. Central Scotland goes from East Kilbride, which is where I live, Scotland's first new town. It's not a new town anymore, it's 70 years old and showing its age in part. Um, so that's where I live and the region goes across to Falkirk, but I'm also a convener of the cross party group on housing. Um, we did a report on rent controls, which can helped us with. I know you've got an interest in that and we're currently working on a report on student homelessness which we're having a discussion about tomorrow. Um, I'm going to try and turn that into layman's language that people will understand um, so that should be coming out fairly soon. So that's me. Um, now Alison you had quite a bit to say when uh, the housing emergency was declared in yeah. Scotland. 
So I just wonder whether you think things have improved mm. since, since then. Um, and if they have, I mean, my guess is they haven't because mm. it's quite a short period of time has yeah. passed. But what do you think needs to, what, what do you think the issues are mm. here in Scotland uh, and what needs to be addressed? I mean, you're absolutely right. It's a relatively short time since there was the declaration in this building, 15th of May, there was a declaration from Scottish Government that acknowledged the scale and the severity of, of what Scotland's experiencing. It's a housing emergency. And I think that declaration has real value. I think it creates an imperative for government to act and to recognise uh, the need to prioritise radical action. Alongside that, I would have to say it was of huge concern to Shelter Scotland that it took so long for that acknowledgement to come, probably for the best part of the previous two years, with incredibly stark warnings from Scottish, uh, Scotland's housing regulator pointing to the risk of systemic failure and then pointing to local authorities falling into systemic failure. And indeed, the chief housing officers of Scotland's local authorities, 78% of them have recently said, we are routinely breaking the law. We cannot keep up with demand. We don't have the resources to do that. And in March this year, Scotland's housing professionals, the Chartered Institute of Housing in Scotland, they declared a housing emergency. And the context for that was local authorities declaring themselves to be in a housing emergency. And we've now got 10. That's almost a third of Scotland's local authorities saying that. And the backdrop to all of that in many senses is this terrible cycle I think we've got into where every time the Scottish Government publishes homelessness statistics, it's a more and more gruesome picture. So Scotland is now starting to break records that we shouldn't be seeking to break. So the latest statistics were back in February and that told us that there had been another increase, a 10% increase in homelessness. It also told us, it's a shocking statistic, 45 kids every day become homeless in Scotland. And those 45 children are joining an already record-breaking number who are stuck in temporary accommodation. So 9,860 kids woke up homeless this morning. And despite all of that, Graham, I would have to say that since that declaration on the 15th of, of May, that sense of an imperative to act, the silence from the Scottish Government has been pretty deafening. And I think you're right. I mean, Shelter of Scotland has continued to try and do whatever we can to be constructive. We've worked with um, partners across the sector to say, well, what are a practical set of priorities here? And we've really tried to hone that down to sort of four big hooks. And it'd be really interesting to get a, a discussion around these. So urgently increase the supply of social homes. And that's about buying them as well as building them. I think it's also about making the best use of the social homes that we do have and prioritising that as much as we can for people who are caught up in homelessness because they're experiencing the harm and hardship of that. I think it's also about making sure that those local authorities that are struggling the most to consistently enforce housing rights, how do we make sure they're funded to, to cope with rising demand? And I think there's also, lastly, a piece about how do we make sure things are affordable across all tenures? And I think the conversation about rent controls is, is just one part of that. And I think it has been across the sector a real desire to, to focus on action. We've got a lot of fantastic laws and policies in Scotland that we should be rightly proud of. There's been a lot of conversation last two years alone, four task groups that the Scottish Government have, have, have set up. Um, and I think <clears throat> looking you know, taking a longer look at things in the 25 years since devolution, this parliament has passed some incredibly big and bold laws, ending right to buy, ending priority need. We are rightly proud of having world leading, highly progressive legislation. But I think we've now reached a stage where you have to call into question the value of that legislation when on an almost industrial scale, those housing rights are being broken every single day. The law is being broken every single day. So I think at this stage, Graham, there's a sense for us at Shelter of Scotland of where is the radical action? Because more of the same isn't going to cut it. More of the same is what's got us into this difficulty. And I think that is about, you know, it's an extraordinary situation that needs an extraordinary response and it needs investment behind that. And I think that's where we need to see political leadership at the highest level. I think that's the First Minister. I think that's the First Minister saying this is a priority, <clears throat> excuse me, and I want departments to focus on this. 
And it's not about because we want to meet arbitrary housing targets. This is because it makes a real difference to people's lives and because we've got nearly 10,000 kids who don't have a place to call home. And I think if we don't act, I think there's a real danger that we're creating a lost generation of children and that has to be a national scandal that this parliament has to, to prioritise. So that is, 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 is my kind of starting point here. I mean, one of, one of the things you um, put out in this sort of joint declaration yeah. that you issued, um, you gave some quite stark statistics. Um, and, 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 you know, it's a couple here. 36 percentage fall in new social homes started since 2022. And 18% fall in new social homes completed in... Uh, 2023. So all, all that's quite worrying, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I think what, what we've understood from a number of conversations that have been taking place, some of the task and finish groups I was talking about, Graeme, is that we know that it's social housing that ends homelessness. The vast majority of people who are stuck in temporary accommodation, it's a social home that they, they want and, and need to move on to. And just at the point where we need that supply programme to be ramped up, it's falling into reverse gear. And again, the Scottish housing regulator has been fairly pointed about that. A recent report that the regulator published saying for the last two years, there's been a slowdown in the supply programme. And worse than that, there's a projection that for the next five years, the programme will continue to decline. So how do we understand what going faster looks like? And I think this, it's not just Shelter Scotland. I think there's a number of stakeholders saying that acquisition, buying homes from the open market is something that enables us to go faster and it is proving to be really successful. So how do we understand going faster in that context? And, you know, it's, where does compulsory purchase orders sit in that? I think that's one of the mechanisms that we're interested in a conversation about. Um, but it's practical tools and, and measures to make sure that we can go faster, but it has to be backed by investment. OK. Um, I think I, I was going to bring Ken in, but I think I'll bring Quajo in, um, if that's all right. Um, because you, in your book, mm -hmm. you're quite scathing um, about right to buy. Mm -hmm. um, very scathing, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder, you probably, you probably agree with what... Uh, uh, you know, Alison's just said. It, even if you just said, let's say you did, let's say you agreed with the policy, and it's long before you were born. Mm -hmm. um, if you agreed with the policy, the problem was there weren't new houses being built um, as as people bought their council homes, and that's of course what we're what we've been seeing it in in Scotland. So, are you seeing the same thing in England? If you could also touch on, because uh, uh, again, another subject which which I thought you wrote about and uh, it was very interesting what you had to say about rent controls and there is a debate here about rent control so I just wonder if you could touch on those two areas yeah definitely um, it's well interesting actually in, in not in regards to rent controls but the first question was just remind me right to buy, right to buy. it was right to buy um, it's, well, to me, and I know I wrote it in the book, the most destructive policy that's been introduced in relation to housing and social housing on record. I mean, a lot of people do make that argument, well, two million people got to buy their own home, but the, at the expense of what? In England, 1.3 million people now waiting to get into social housing. 151,000 homeless kids, that's nearly enough homeless kids to fill the O2 arena more than seven times over the amount of people that are rough sleeping at the moment. This is what the policy has resulted in. And everyone always says, well, the right to buy scheme was about allowing people to buy their homes, those from working class backgrounds. But along with that came a clear indication that those homes would be replaced. They didn't do that and they never did that. So by default, automatically, that policy has failed. And it has failed catastrophically. Because not only has it impacted the lives of some of the most vulnerable people in the country, but also it's affected the private rented sector too, and uh, the possibility of those struggling in the private sector to find a way of escaping the private sector and finding support from their local authorities. It's put huge pressures on local authorities and their finances. 
All we have to do is look at the cost of housing benefit at the moment. And all we have to look at the cost of temporary accommodation. It's predicted £2 billion will be spent this year, and this is in England, on temporary accommodation. Yet we've got 1.3 million people waiting to get into social housing. Uh, it, it's, it's been absolutely it, it, devastating, um, the worst policy introduced. Um, and it's a shame because I see people on a daily basis when I go out and about, people up and down the country. There's been instances where there's been kids who have, well, nearly teenagers, 12 years old, um, for their whole lives haven't had anywhere to call when they f or call home when they finish school at the end of the day. It's always been temporary accommodation or it's been a and b or it's been a hotel moving every 28 days and they're failing in their education because they can't expect to get a good quality level of education. And that can be directly related, although it was decades ago, its introduction was decades ago. How could we not foresee as politicians, some of the most, especially back then, some of the most educated, or you expect some of the most educated people in the country, how could they not foresee that a policy like that, especially with the promise of rebuilding those homes um, and promise it at a speed that we were selling them off, how do they ever think that was going to be possible? And now we are left in a housing crisis like, like we've never seen before. Um, and that second question was on rent controls. And there's been a lot of this because the way in which I see this housing crisis is intertwined. I don't see it as sort of individual areas. The private rented sector affects social housing and home ownership, and it all works in a sort of circle. And each, each of those circles are broken at the moment. And although I complain a lot about the state of social housing at the moment, especially when it comes to conditions. We know that one in four homes, if this is in England, one in four homes um, do, does not meet the decent home standard, and that's private rented homes in England, and it's similar in social housing, but the difference with private rented accommodation is people are paying ridiculous amounts in some cases, the majority of their wages every month in private rent just to keep a roof over their head, and it doesn't matter whether it's in a livable condition or not. There's far too many people having to go through that, having to decide whether they're going to feed themselves, heat their homes, pay their rent. And also on top of that, what compounds that too is um, the use of Section 21 notices that we still have even now. We are seeing record levels of Section 21 notices being used. And where do these families turn? They can't then go and look to privately rent elsewhere because we've got bidding wars in the private rented sector. They're going to struggle. So where do they turn their local authority where we've got 1.3 million people ahead of them. So we talk about rent controls, and I know Sadiq Khan, for example, has suggested um, the idea of rent controls, and there, there have many occasions where rent controls and different models have been suggested. I think that elephant has to be tackled. There is a massive elephant in the room, and that comes with affordability, and we cannot truly fix this housing crisis unless we tackle affordability, because it's going to continue to drive homelessness and pressure on councils who are on their knees as it is. So we have to tackle that, that affordability crisis. And whether it's given the name rent control, there has to be something and there has to be some sort of barrier set on how much is being charged for a necessity, for a roof over our heads, because it's something that we all need. And this is this notion, especially when I was writing my book, I saw it in comparison to like Germany and Vienna, for example, there's this notion that a house and a home should be a representation of one's wealth. Um, it's an accumulation of your wealth instead of it being a necessity. And we've, 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 we've taken this idea of a home and created a commodity rather than thinking it's just as important as food and water and the air that we breathe, especially for young people and vulnerable people. It's something that we all need. And what we've done now is been able to basically turn it into a free-for-all where we're having bidding wars for, for shelter. And that's why I think it does, it does, something has to be brought in in order to um, control rents in the private rented sector. Something has to be done. I don't know, I don't have the answer to what that would look like, but it cannot continue on the trajectory that it is. Otherwise, we, we cannot fix the rest of the housing crisis. Okay, thanks. Um, by the way, I will uh, bring you in. So if you've got questions, start thinking about them. Um, and we'll, I'll, in, I'll invite your hands to go up. Ken. We, we as the cross-party group, we, we did a report on rent controls. And I, I think that was actually, that was before the rent controls came in. 
But there has been, in Scotland that is, um, there has been criticism of the way that was done and how rents have actually gone up. Um, and particularly in Edinburgh, where they've gone up quite a lot and squeezed people out of the market. Edinburgh is fairly unique in Scotland. It's got, a, I would say, an overheated market. But as someone who does research into this, is that something you've seen? And I know you want to speak up about other stuff as well, so maybe when you answered that, you could talk about how you think, and this is a big question, um, the housing system could be reformed. You did, you did say you wanted to. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you left me with the easy stuff. That's the genesis of you, Graham. Um, OK, so a number of things to say, I suppose. Uh, so we've done a lot of research on rent control. There's a lot of work internationally. I was looking at Germany, looking at uh, various systems in the Netherlands and Sweden and the United States and, and, and all over the place. And uh, mainly because we haven't had rent controls in Britain for a long time. Although actually in 2016 we had this very comprehensive re private renter sector legislation in Scotland and there were a form of rent controls introduced in that, the so-called uh, uh, rent pressure zones, which were a way in which local authorities could cap rent increases. Nobody ever used them. They st they're still on the books. They've never been used. Uh, there was a big kind of data threshold, an evidence threshold, before it was, it was uh, something that could be done. And actually, press rent pressures were different. They were specific to places like Edinburgh, one or two uh, other specific sub-markets. Sub but what, what's been interesting is that we went through a period from 2021 onwards when the Butte House Agreement was signed between the Greens and the SNP. Uh, there was going to be a national rent control policy. It was going to be introduced. And so we got involved in some of the evidence collection about other models and, and trying to provide an independent, objective view about it as far as you can be objective. And, uh, and we were going through that process. We wrote a couple of reports. And then... Uh, in the midst of all that, in October 2022, the Scottish Government really, with very little warning, uh, announced a rent freeze in the private rental sector. I'm telling you things you all, most of you already know. Uh, but that was a remarkable thing because that's what we uh, academics would call a first generation rent control, or a hard rent control, so freezing rents initially for six months and then capped thereafter. And of course, they also tried to uh, set controls on social rent increases, which is what happens in England. Uh, and the uh, uh, trade bodies managed to s reverse that, convince government that that wasn't required in Scotland because there were already de facto caps, or not caps, but limits to rent increases that the regulator helped enforce. Uh, but this rent freeze has been remarkable because what it did was it froze rent for existing tenancies but basically uh, allowed new tenancies to increase their rents at market rates. And what actually happened, and, and John Blackwood, who's the sort of lead guy in the, in the private landlords, said, this shows you what can happen with rent controls. You can actually lead to rapidly increasing rents because of the way the thing has been designed. And, and what that also means is that you have this big distributional effect. I don't mean between tenants and landlords, but I mean between existing tenants benefiting from the freeze clearly in, in a cost of living crisis and you know in a sense we applaud that and that's that's really good but for everybody else for new tenants for people who have to move they're facing real term big rent increases going going on and that's what we've seen in edinburgh and glasgow and dundee and aberdeen over, over the piece and that was not the plan and that's about design it's about how you design these policies so i've got uh, an economics training and that normally means people are just you, you assume that you're opposed to rent controls. I'm not opposed to them, but I, so I think it's a finely balanced thing and it's about design and it's about implementation. It's about doing it properly and it's about having complementary policies alongside it, like building social housing you know, on, on, at a large scale. You need to do all, all of these things. Rent controls on their own are not going to have... Uh, they are not a panacea. You know, they can't be. I think they have to be very carefully designed. I'm, I'm personally more in favour of what you might call second or third generation rent controls, which are the kinds of things you see in most European uh, nations. They're, they're about controlling the increase in re rents, about looking at individual properties and the quality of those properties, looking at local markets and having the evidence to, to understand that. But they are uh, operating alongside 
social housing policies that are operating alongside anti-homelessness policies, etc. And I think the trouble was in Scotland that the, the rent freeze and cap coincided with what became the, the cuts in public expenditure that Alison talked, talked about in terms of impacts on social housing investment. So it's, it's a finely... It's a fine balance, but it should be evidence-based. It should be uh, designed properly. It should be implementable. The other thing is that local government has to implement these policies. They have to enforce them and, and, and make sure they work. And we just assume that local government can do that. We just assume they've got the resources and the capacity to do that. Uh, the same way that we assume they've got the resources to, plan, to do the planning part of new house building. But in many places they don't because there aren't enough people working in planning. So, you know, you've you make risks by pursuing policies that assume that they are. So implementability is a huge uh, issue. But as I say, absolutely categorically, I'm not opposed to them. I just think they have to be well designed uh, and, and they're not always uh, well designed. The interesting thing about the legislation that's in the current housing bill for this national rent control policy is that it again makes big assumptions about local authorities evidence based that they'll collect the evidence, they'll analyse uh, what's going on in the rental market uh, and they'll be able to enforce and, and look after it. That's a really big assumption to make, and, and that could lead to a whole bunch of uh, challenges down, down the road. So I'll maybe stop there and we can come back to reform later on if you want. OK, we'll come, we'll come back to reform. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think the point you make about councils uh, and capacity is, is well made, because, and, and it'll be the same in England. Yeah. You know, ca councils are, are really up against it. Um, in terms of you know, bu budget-wise and the amount of expertise they've lost over the years, not just in housing but in planning as well. It's, it's often said that uh, compared to some other housing policies like grant-funded building and social housing, that rent control is a cheap policy. It's not cheap at all. It's not cheap if it goes wrong and it actually does need resource for that capacity. I mean, there's, do it properly, you know, that's, that's essential. Um, before I open it up, Alison, what, uh, do you have a view on... Um, rent controls and how it's been done in Scotland? I mean, I'd, I'd probably pick up on and echo some of the points that both Craig and Ken made, because I think you're right. It's, it's seeing that interrelationship between social and private. And I think quite often what we're seeing is because of a lack of social housing, more people are forced to rent privately when that's not necessarily their preference. And, you know, that then in itself drives rents up. And I think... You know, you can make an, a, an option to tweak the system or you can make an option to really intervene. And I think we would come down the side of that public intervention in the market, which says we need more social homes. That's one of the things that would really make the difference in terms of affordability. And that's a, that's a big state intervention. And I think it is about moving away from the commodification of housing. It's a basic right. It's a basic necessity. But we've allowed ourselves in the last few decades, we've allowed ourselves as a society to talk about buying, selling, commodification, etc. But housing should be a right. Housing is an absolute basic. So I think rent controls in terms of the, the current conversation in Scotland um, and the, the housing bill that we understand will, will, will potentially come through this parliament. The thinking is very underdeveloped. It's very difficult to comment on that. It's very difficult to predict what impact that will have. And I think in the context of a housing emergency, Shelter Scotland's concern remains with the people who are stuck in the homelessness system and their acute need and what, what are the actions that we need to take to deal with that. Um, so I think there's a lot of good ideas, interesting conversations, but it's untested. OK. Um, just before I do open it up, um, I just wonder whether we can have a quick discussion about the condition of housing um, across the UK mm. and what we do to improve mm. the condition of housing. Mm. Um, as you both know, we, we had a, um, a working group on tenement maintenance, mm. tenements, flats, basically. Um, I know you talk uh, 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 quite a bit about Grenfell. Mm -hmm. um, we've had leg legislation just only just gone through the Scottish Parliament. We are mm. playing catch-up here. Um, so the issue of how it's a bit huge issue this, but um, how do we how do we bring up the quality of existing homes? I mean, I think in terms of the standard of homes, if we're talking about social homes, just to, to, to be clear, I mean, I think it's it's 
it's about what we do we need to do to build more as well as to maintain what we've got. And all of the, the, the current situation we see isn't by accident. Again, it is by design. And it's, it's decades of underinvestment in social housing. And I think, you know, we're in a situation in Scotland in terms of the slowdown of supply. I think we're in danger of seeing that the, the total amount of social housing start to go into decline because all housing has a, a natural end point and, it, and it, de it depletes over time. And I think certainly when we've tried to look at bringing what are called long term voids back into use, there comes a point where it's not economically viable to do that. So I think it can't just be about bringing new supply on and any old supply will do. It needs to be the right homes in the right places and a decent standard. And I think it is about, you know, going back to some of your points, Ken, that investment is there to support social landlords to maintain the standards of their property as well as to bring more on stream. It has to be both. We can't allow it to be a choice between new homes and the, the quality of what we've got. It's got to be both because this is, as you're saying, which it's where people live, it's where people build their lives, it's an essential to health, to well-being, to everything else that we all want to do, and nothing is more important than home. Okay, Kwasia? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, I also think it starts with taking pride in social housing, and I think that's something that's been missing from the sector for such a long time. The stereotype that's within social housing has been a negative one, certainly for longer than I've been alive, for absolute generations. And once upon a time, social housing was something to be proud of. It was something our key workers wanted to live in. They aspired to live into, or well, want to move into social social homes. There's a sense of community there. That is all absolute, that's no, that's no longer existent, especially in the states that I visit um, daily, weekly, certainly my estate. Instead, now you know of the estates to avoid which areas not to go around because the council lot are there or those living in social housing or there's this st stereotype of what a social housing tenant is, what they do or what they don't do. But having travelled the country, it couldn't be further from the truth. The mixture of people that I've seen has, I mean, even blown my mind and I've grown up in social housing and I think that element of they're not being pride, but also the negative stigma there. I don't know if you remember shows like How to Get a Council Home and Benefit Street and those sorts of shows that push this narrative of what a social housing tenant is. Those stereotypes have lasted up until this point and will continue to last. That is why it's not seen as a priority. That's why there's no urgency or pride to want to build those homes. But we should be as proud as or even proud of building social housing than any other tenure of housing because we should understand what it did after the Second World War and the impact it made on the country, not just to the lives of ordinary individuals, but economically too. Um, and, and it's been proven that the same can be done now. We are, safe, safe, we are facing a social housing crisis on the scale that we faced after the Second World War, and it needs a similar... Um, response. We have to be building quality homes. My one worry is, though, my really, really big worry is some of the homes that I go into, unfortunately, that are falling to bits happen to be new builds. And I've been into new build flats um, that have been built after the Grenfell fire. And I've been in there and they're filled with damp and mould, um, burst water pipes, you name it. I've seen it flooded with raw sewage. And it worries me because um, these, ho these, these flats um, were, were built less than seven years ago, yet they are falling apart now. And I don't know if it's because they are poorly built or they are just not maintained. And I don't know if that comes back down to pride and taking these homes seriously and making sure they last or taking the people living in those homes seriously, their health and their safety. But it absolutely should be a priority. So we need to be building more homes. We cannot forget about those that are living in slum conditions. Like I mentioned, there's still one in four uh, people in England are living in homes that don't meet the decent home standard currently. And let me just tell you, the English decent home standard is not decent at all. I mean, half the things that I see when I walk into people's homes... It's not on their current list, but absolutely no one would consider the conditions that I've seen decent in any way. So we have to be making sure we are investing in the stock that we currently have, but building the homes that people are going to live in for generations to come, homes that they can be proud of with them in mind, not just to meet government targets and knocking up any old rubbish. We have to be building homes that are going to last, that we can be proud of, that blends in. Um, and it's something that the government should look towards as being an investment, a long-term investment, not just socially, 
but also economically too, because we talk about economic growth, right, and de delivering economic prosperity, so that's certainly what um, Rachel Reeves has been talking about and Keir Starmer. You cannot do that if people don't have a decent, safe and affordable roof over their head, if they cannot go to work because they have nowhere to return to to call home, if a kid, child cannot go to school and return to a place that they can call home because they're being moved around the country every 20 eight days, or the NHS, for example, is having to spend £1.4 billion every year looking after people who have come in because of the poor conditions they're having to live in, or £38 million, like they're currently spending, on looking after people living in homes in England with damp and mould issues. You cannot deliver that. So that is, that, that is what really should motivate them. That should be the argument. And the fact that we've got 151,000 homeless kids, I don't, quite frankly, I think that's bigger, that's a big enough argument as to why this should be seen as a priority. Um, and I hope it will be. And I think you, you make the point um, very well um, in your book. And it's something I, I completely agree with. Is that housing doesn't really get the publicity that it should get. Mm -hmm. It's only when things go wrong that the, the media, and I used to work in the media, um, actually take, take an interest. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's, that's wrong. We were talking... Um, before you arrive late, Quasia, um, um, you know, about um, try. Actually, you, sometimes you struggle to get politicians interested in housing. And that's probably why you've had this succession of housing ministers. You say that again uh, in, in your book. Um, I used to represent my party. By the way, you hate my party. And that comes across strongly. But ho <laughs> hopefully, you don't hate me. Um, no, no, no. But. Um, you know, so my party was in government. Um, I led on housing here uh, in the last session, and we went through a, a succession mm -hmm. of housing ministers mm -hmm. down south. I couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. So, am I meant to? Yeah. You know, who am I meant to talk to? And it changes every five minutes. And yeah. actually, we've had uh, quite a revolving door here in Scotland. Yeah. It do it doesn't help. No. You need some continuity. You need someone who actually has a passion for the subject. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted just to build on some of the things about what seems to me is one of the difficulties. One of the things in Quajo's book is really interesting is this idea of housing as a system and, and that everything's interconnected. There are feedback loops. You do something over here and it has an adverse effect over here or an unexpected effect over here. And we have all sorts of bits in our housing policy systems which do that. And if you've got effectively choices that politicians and providers have to make about whether they invest in their existing stock or they invest in retrofitting for net zero or they invest to support new build, they're only, they've only got rental income really that, that underpins all of that. It can't do all, all of these things. So they have to make these invidious choices. But at the same time, we have a policy system in Scotland which allocates resources for new build in different parts of the country which steers itself towards actually what they call, uh, it's a vaguely jargon term, reprovisioning as opposed to new, new build. So in the west, of, very crudely in the west of Scotland, a lot of the new build investment is in reprovisioning, which basically means social landlords have got deteriorating stock. They've got choices over what they do with them. They decide to demolish them and build new housing in their place. They're not actually meeting additional needs. They might meet a little bit, depending on the the cartilage and the shape of what they build. But what they're actually doing is they're replacing existing stock. So they're choosing not to invest in that stock. And we have actually less properties being built. So you might be interested to know that the way the resources are allocated just now actually favours West Central Scotland and hence reprovisioning as opposed to affordable need like you'd have in, in Edinburgh. So that's just one of the consequences of the way the systems work. And that's kind of a formula that government works with. So in a time of crisis where we've got less and less funds available and we think there should be more social housing built, perhaps we ought to be doing less in reprovisioning, more in asset improvement of the existing stock and freeing up some resource for, for where the affordable need is really strong. But that's a political judgment and that's something that you know, the politicians and COSLA and the government would have to sign up to, which is not easy, as you can imagine. And, and just if I may, I think, I think there's a point that occurs to me when you say that and goes back to some of your comments. Could you, I mean, of course, we understand that this is a, a challenging time fiscally across the UK. We're, we're, we're hearing those signals from, from Scottish government about potentially what the, their budget will look like later on this year. Of course, we understand that. 
But I think that should take us to a point where we're more rigorous and more robust about understanding, well, well where is the money in the system? And it, and it goes from some of what you were saying, could you, let's look at the money that's been spent on local housing allowance, on housing benefit. That's a colossal amount of money, but that isn't going into bricks and mortar. That's propping up a broken system. So it's about making those political choices about how we understand the system and how we can understand the changes to the system that will actually drive the value that we all want to see, which is we all have a decent place to, to call and, and that makes a slightly different point to what you said at the beginning, uh, Graham, when you said that housing is devolved in Scotland. It is devolved, but it critically depends on the UK decisions in the housing benefit system. And it also, the mortgage market isn't devolved. It's, it's a UK and an international market. And the public spending rules are what the Treasury decides uh, and what the UK government decides. So we have to operate within that envelope, and that's quite challenging, particularly now. OK, I want to open it up to you lovely people. Is there a roving mic? There is a roving mic. Right. Hands up. I like the look of you. I'll come to you. <laughs> if I don't, you've got no chance. Right. This guy. Um... Say your name if you want to. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, Lindsay Bromwich. Um, I'm just wondering how much, certainly from a, I'm not an economist or anything, but we mentioned about the, the rent caps. It looked like a car crash from the moment it was announced to me and certainly everybody else I seem to speak to. And I echo what you've said about the, you know, it should have been a, a more in-depth, longer-term, well-thought-out policy. But my question is, and I appreciate we've got a politician sitting here, are politicians in general guilty of going for soundbite policies that make them they can make a big splash yet yeah, we've, we've capped the rents we've solved this problem uh, to get a, a popularity to get headlines uh, and to get votes ultimately but at the cost of the the person in the street who's suffering from all the problems you've quite rightly just highlighted whereas if it was more um, joined up it goes back to your, your right to buy that was a similar sort of thing when that was introduced. Do you know what I mean? It, it was sold as a, a really good thing. And I just wonder, I, I feel as though there's a lot of responsibility to be borne by our national politicians, be they Scottish, English, Welsh, or whatever it is. There needs to be a, more, a lot more for me long term. And I, I know we need solutions now, but the world isn't that easy. We need to look not from one week to the next or even one government to the next. We need to be looking through generations. Do you know what I mean? Not... I need the votes next week, next month, next year. That's irrelevant as far as the people who are actually living in these properties are concerned. I'm a private landlord, so I'm happy to be beaten up over that. Um, but equally, there's lots of sound bites here coming from politicians beating up the private landlords. You can go to any of my properties, absolutely any of them. I've got long-term tenants. I've had across the spectrum of you know whatever sort of background you want, single parents, foreign nationals. Um, I've got, you know... I'm not going to list it, but I, you know, I, I I'm completely happy to defend my position. All my rents, I say, all my, I've only got five, but they're all well below market rent. I think some of them are probably challenging social housing rents because I don't need the money. I enjoy the actual process of giving them homes. That gets no credit in the press, and I'm not on my own. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people like me who just want to give people good homes and enjoy the process. I'm not saying with the majority, I would say the majority there are real problems with. But let's deal with the, the, that. It's a difficult thing to do to deal with. But the politicians, and I've worked with the politicians in previous jobs, they don't want to tackle the really hard jobs of going into the substandard housing, be it private or social, and actually dealing with them, dealing with the offenders, getting rid of them at the market altogether. It's not easy. I know it's not easy. But I just wonder how much we feel, back to my basic question, is a responsibility of politicians not looking at the bigger picture and the longer term. They're just looking for short-term games. I do not mean to be offensive to yourself, sir. You're not. <laughs> I don't you know you, sir. It's yeah, not you, you, won't, you won't offend me. Um, no, but you're right. You, you, you are. Now, hand the mic back. You might make another speech. <laughs> um, no, you're completely right. Um, too many politicians just go for the headlines and the soundbite. Uh, when actually you need long-term long solutions. 
Um, and often you don't get that. Anyone that's want something about the revolving door? M yes. Ministers in England, because they, they would come into office, they'd want to do something, make a splash, be seen, and they'd be gone before it was implemented, and the next minister was in, and they'd kind of move on to something else. And you just get that for five, six, seven, eight years. What, what do you have in terms of policy outcomes? Mm -hmm. Nonsense. Yeah. And, and I think if you could just add to that, because I, 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 you know, I think in some senses some of the sentiment you're expressing there was, was something I was talking about at the beginning, which is I don't think in Scotland it's a... We've, we're not missing the laws, we're not missing the policies. We've, we've got buckets of those, you know. It's are they being implemented? Bluntly, no. And, and I think this is then about those difficult political choices. And at the moment those difficult political choices would have to include we're going to spend less on these things over here because we have made a choice to spend more things, more on, on, on housing. And I think if we don't do that, if the Scottish Government doesn't do that, they are then presiding over a system going into decline rather than deciding to arrest a growing housing emergency. It is about political choices. It is about political leadership. Yep. OK, I'll bring somebody else in. Over there. This is no, 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 no. Forward, forward. That lady there in the jumper. Okay. Thank you. Um, around about the time that Edinburgh announced the housing emergency, I became aware of a large number of council houses in uh, our community council area that were lying empty and had been empty for some of them as much as several years. Um, when I inquired of the housing officer the reason for that, I was amazed to find that in some cases it was because the previous tenant had gone off without paying the electricity bill or there were repairs that needed to be done and the council didn't have the money. So I'm wondering, if, if are there more imaginative solutions to that kind of problem so that these properties can be brought back into use quickly? Is it not possible to offer tenants the opportunity of taking a home that needs work done and giving them a, a grant to do some of the work themselves? I'm sure there'd be people who'd be happy with that. Thank you. So the, the, the whole issue of empty homes, yeah. really. Quasar. Yeah, this is actually something that I touched on um, only a few months ago, and I knew that it had already been spoken about up here in Scotland, and I know across the UK um, it's predominantly focused on private rented homes that are left empty, and one day I got bored, so I decided I was going to um, FOI every council in England and ask them how many of their homes have been sat empty for three months, six months, and longer than a year. And by the time I was finished across England, um, I think this was March of this year, actually, or maybe May, um, there were about 34,000 empty council properties at that time. Um, of that, I think it was about 7,000 had been empty for longer than a year. That didn't include housing association properties. We didn't add the number on top, but had we had done that, that was more than 70,000 empty social homes in England alone. And that number will be pretty similar right now. And I did that work with Sky News. Um, and we focused predominantly on England because that, that hadn't been done up until that point. And it's absolutely horrific consi considering we've got um, 1.3 million people waiting on our social housing waiting list and not only that we had worked with specific families who were told by council leaders and members of staff from councils that there are no homes available they have to pack their stuff up with their kids take them out of school leave their jobs move to the other side of the country in order to find somewhere to call home yet for example in Lambeth which was one borough I mean my mom lives in Lambeth I went to um, an estate and there was a block there um, that had been boarded up for 20 years. Um, yeah, actually, no, longer than 20 years. I think it was 1998. I was born in 1998 and it's still boarded up now. Um, so there had been many instances of blocks being boarded up for decades and not regenerated, turned into use. And for those, there's no excuse. There's absolutely, it's just a complete and utter absolute failure and dereliction of duty because we have people who don't have anywhere to call home and we've got buildings that could have been retrofitted, could have been redeveloped in that scale of time, um, rebuilt, turned around and turned into, not just, um, it doesn't even have to be permanent social homes. It could be used as temporary accommodation, but instead we're spending two billion a year, handing two billion a year to the private sector and private management companies for temporary accommodation. Yet we've got these homes that could be generating rent for councils, 
many of which are claiming they're on the verge of bankruptcy because of their cost of temporary accommodation could be generating rent for them, but it isn't. And that comes down to inefficiency from councils, and that conversation certainly has to be had, especially after that. There has to be better streamlining in the way that, and money management in the way that councils are using money, because yes, they are absolutely cash strapped and they've had funding cuts, but they are by far innocent when it comes to criticism, especially when it comes to the way in which they spend money, money that they say that they don't have, and that's just one example of it. So this empty home scandal, I mean, if we, do, if we did count, calculate the number of homes, both private and social homes, I don't know how many homeless people we could house, but I'm sure it would be a lot. Yeah. Of course, it's not just empty um, homes for social rent. Yeah. You've got empty homes which are privately owned and are not rented out, mm -hmm. just lying there empty. Um, decaying. I mean, just to offer a, a thought on that, because I'm, I'm very mindful of the point you're making, and I think it is those two sides, Graham, isn't it? I think it's voids, as we call them, dreadful phrase, but, you know, social lets that haven't been relay. And I know in Edinburgh, they've now set themselves a target of turning that around much faster, and also making sure as they bring those voids in to use that they're allocated to homeless households so they start dealing with the problem. I think there's then the issue that you're talking about, Graham, which is empty homes, more on the private side, and, and Shelter Scotland hosts the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership. We work with local authorities across the country, and we work with communities. It's a bit of a sort of housing Miss Marple. It's working with communities to tell us about the properties that are sitting empty, and then we'll start doing the wraparound, identifying the owner, identifying the grants that could bring those properties back into use. And I think particularly in the context of a housing emergency, we have to see every single property as being part of the solution or having the potential to be part of the solution. So action needs to be taken absolutely whether it's a, a social let sitting there or a private property okay. I, I don't want to ruin anyone's parade too much but uh, I think one of the issues with this is it's a, it's a bit like you know when we think about housing in general we, 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 we mustn't just treat it as, as a homogenous single thing and I mean I've been really struck I did a little bit of work with the Empty Homes Partnership in Scotland and, and just struck by how challenging what their job was because in the private sector in particular you had this huge range of, of problems and many, many properties that they deal with they have had on their books for many years because there isn't, there isn't a solution. There just isn't a, a solution. So we can't say there's X thousand properties that are empty and there's X thousand properties that can be filled. Sadly, it's not like that. There, there, and so you actually need to have quite a a kind of micro focus on individual properties and what's possible and it varies huge, hugely despite the fantastic job that Empty Homes Partnership does. The other thing is that uh, I mean I've been struck that those those local authorities that have declared a housing emergency they, they see voids as you know something they really ought to have dealt with mm -hmm. before but now this is something that they can actually make a priority and they can focus it on, on people who are, who are homeless and I'm, I'm sure that's going to be that's I mean the irony is it's almost, almost like that's, that's a low-hanging fruit almost to, to try and deal with some of the things that they can deal with. Uh, they, they can make, make a difference. But they will also find there will be, there'll be voids which are problematic for whatever reason. But, but property is lying empty for 20 odd years. Is that yeah, yeah, and I mean, some of the, for example, some of the, um, the voids that I went down to see at the time of that investigation, we actually looked, and some of them are whole estates that have been said they're going to be regenerated. The families have been moved out. But actually, when we went to check, when the date of re, um, regenerating was, there is no date there. So, I mean, it could be in 10 years' time. And it had, some of the homes had newly refurbished kitchens, um, completely fine to, by the looks of things, to live in. Um, and with, in terms of the investigation too, so the homes that were sat empty for longer than a year, so the majority of homes were empty longer than six months. Um, so that turnaround time was poor anyway. But also, we have to keep in mind, the longer you leave a property sat empty without a family living in there, the, 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 the more likely it's going to fall into a state of disrepair with damp and mould and all of these issues. So th it's absolutely true that there will be homes there that, are, that need major works, for example, and it's going to take a lot of time and investment. But there are ho other homes like the ones that I've suggested that could perhaps m need a bit of painting or whatnot. You could get a family in there that then left for a year and then it has development of damp, mould, leaks, etc. And all of a sudden that is now a major works property and off 
limit and I think there has to be closer inspection of the homes that are falling in. There has to be closer inspection of the void process in general, inspections of the homes that are being considered a, as voids. Otherwise, we're going to end up voiding all of these homes that seem like somewhat of a challenge, which could, during a housing crisis, actually be turned around with a bit of investment and generate more money um, or, or definitely return that investment in a short period of time if it's rented out to a family. So I, th I think there has to be better efficiency there when it comes to voided homes. Yeah. Okay, who's next? You were very quick there. I have a question for Professor Gibb. Any one person can only live in one house at a time. So to free up some of these second homes, should we consider heavily taxing people who have a second home? In some cases, uh, <laughs> I, I, I love to nuance, you know. Before the answer, that is actually already happening. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, that's yeah, right. Um, we get people with second homes, well, particularly, well, not just if you rent, you are charged double council tax. Um, so yeah. that is a tax. And, and we also have stamp, stamp duty greatly is greatly higher in, in Britain, particularly in Scotland, actually, for uh, uh, properties which are not your, your primary uh, residence. It's directly aimed at landlords. Uh, uh, you know, so I mean, it's significantly higher tax rates they pay. Yeah. Uh, we have all, and you know, throughout the UK, we have big debates about short-term lets in particular and the impacts it has. Short-term lets are extremely well uh, advocated on their behalf. They, are, they, are, they have a very professional group of people who support their, 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 their interests. The sort of to, to, tourism industry, that obviously there are a whole set of micro neighbourhood issues attached to them, but also they're taking a lot of housing out of the housing system at a time of, of, sh of shortage and spiralling rents and unaffordability. So there are real uh, ch challenges about that. But I think we, we always, again, I would say this, but I mean, I think we would think really carefully about how we design any tax changes and, and think about the consequences about how it's done because we could make things actually worse. Yeah, yes, quite. Yeah. Just in relation to tax, because I know I will completely forget otherwise. Um, one of the suggestions I made was, especially in places like London, where entire developments for, in some cases have been bought up by foreign buyers and left to sit empty until prices increase. One of the suggestions I, I made was, why don't we tax them and invest that money into building the homes that we need and social housing, etc. Because why are they just during a UK's biggest housing crisis being left to sit empty? And perhaps that's something that could be done uh, around the whole country, because no doubt that is happening around the whole country. I mean, a home is a necessity, and far too many people don't have that, and it's seen as a luxury now. Um, but also, I don't know how bad the problem is up here with Airbnb. Um, <laughs> but th th there has to be something done in relation to Airbnb. Down in London, I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible. And now what's happening is we had situations obviously where we had private landlords but what's happened and I have friends that um, are private landlords and they've, they've been honest and open and told me they've switched from renting out their properties as homes for families to switch into Airbnb because they can generate more income and more money but what we're, hap we're seeing down in like um, rural areas and down by the sea and whatnot is people being driven out by the increase in cost because there's far too many Airbnbs and holiday lets and not enough places for people to rent and buy, and it's becoming a real problem and only um, adding on to the current housing crisis and making things far more difficult here. And I don't know how much tax Airbnb is currently paying, but I'm sure they can offer up some more <laughs> in order to <laughs> help fix the current housing crisis that we're facing. So I don't know, that's just a suggestion. Okay, hold, on, hold on to your thoughts, because there's a guy at the back um, in the blue, that's you who's very keen to get in. Yeah, I, I am keen to get in because I think um, I find it shocking that we're driving investment out of Scotland. Already, by living in this country, we're paying a lot more tax. Uh, people don't want to come and invest here anymore. And who put you in charge of telling me what I do with my money? 
you know, if, if I buy a property, it's up to me to, to look, if I want to rent it out, I should do it according to the laws. But I feel quite passionately that private landlords are being demonized uh, quite significantly, including the famous comment about the, who cares about the entitled landlords of Morningside. You know, it is missing an entire sector. So there needs to be a balance, but uh, driving out investment is certainly not going to help Scotland. Well, uh, that, that, that comment uh, was made um, at a conference at which the, housing, the current housing minister was at, and he was accused of driving investment out of Scotland. Um, I don't know if you've got any, either of you got any comments on that. You go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly got away with it there. Nearly, nearly got an extra minute to think about it. Uh, I, I forgot to say uh, during one of the main criticisms of the rent freeze was its impact on the build to rent uh, sector and the freezing of investment by institutional investors. And that may not be viewed as the most important thing if you're focused on social housing and homelessness and housing need, but it's an important part of of, of investment in the in the in the private rental sector and, 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 and providing opportunities for people who, who aren't going to be able to own, for, for, for instance, for the time being. Uh, and it's also where, as somebody said recently, where uh, a lot of people are in this room, I'm sure, people who work in are saving for pensions, their pensions would be investing in those things. So, so you know, everything is linked together, the economy links to that kind of thing. And that wasn't part of the plan for my city in Glasgow. Uh, built to rent investment essentially stopped and that was a critical part of the city region's economic development plan is to provide new housing for younger workers, graduates to stay in the city to work there etc. So that was not part of what the government thought would happen as a result but that's how the pension funds and insurance companies responded to that so that wasn't good. So you're absolutely right in the sense that there has to be a balance and the thing that's often missing I think is a lack of a vision about what a functional well-run private rented sector with all its structuration and all its segments would actually look like and how it could operate best. I just don't think our policy thinking is coherent. It's not kind of joined up and thought, thought through and it definitely doesn't have a strategy. But that doesn't in any way excuse those examples of bad private landlords or price gouging or, or anything like that uh, that we, we also we all not, not know about. But the final thing I'll say on my rant is that uh, I think it's also the case that we actually have really poor statistical evidence about the behaviour, the motivations and what's actually happening in the private rental sector. We have, we have some limited surveys that the Scottish Association of Landlords do, which is good that they do it, but we just don't really know at the micro level what motivates buy-to-let landlords in particular, but, but you know, the sector as a whole. And we, we have, you know, that's just not good, good really enough. Interesting. Yeah, but whatever harms... No, indeed, but also it's 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 a it's a failure to think systemically. You know, if we're going to think about the housing system working function as a whole, we need to have a handle on what's a really big part of the housing system playing a critical role where many of the problems actually are in terms of people who don't have anywhere else to to, to uh, live. So we, we need to know much more and do it much better. I think. I mean, I th I think it's and I will I will bring you in. I think it's an example of government. Actually, it doesn't matter what colour the government is, mm. of doing something and not thinking through the consequences, mm. not thinking through what the reaction might be to whatever it is they, they, they do. So if you, mm. you bring in, well, in this case, uh, a, a blunt uh, tool of rent controls, mm. the system they brought in here was almost inevitably going to have uh, a response, uh, and that was the driving away of investment, mm. which is not a good thing. I mean, the only additional thoughts, again, to pick up on your point that, that Ken echoed about balance, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think in the context of a housing emergency, when what we really need to do is drive up the, the, the supply of social housing. That, that, that's, what it's, you know, that's what we need. It's not about driving up private sector. I think it's also recognising that the financing of, of social housing supply is about private investment as well as, as, as government investment, but you need to get that balance absolutely right because housing associations, for example, are really good, really good about securing private investment. 
but those loans need to be serviced. So if you, if you, if you, you kind of get that out of balance, you're going to drive up the rents, which kind of defeats the purpose in terms of supply of affordable housing. So I think you're absolutely right. Is that balance in our system overall? And what do we need to prioritise right now in the context of a housing emergency when we've got people desperately locked out of any form of decent housing at all? Okay. Now, yes, and I, I, I will come to you. Thank you. I, I remember when Edinburgh declared a, a housing emergency and thinking, what does that mean? You know, is it a facile statement or what actually has followed or what does follow from the declaration of a housing emergency? Are there any more pauses? Is there any more money going anywhere? You know, what does it mean, housing emergency? I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I, I think it can't just be words. So I think if it's just a badge, then what was the point of that? I think declaring a housing emergency is an important first step because it's recognising the extent of the problem, but that's only the first step. Now, what Edinburgh have moved on to do is to work with a whole range of partners to see what does better look like in the context of the, the, the acute difficulties that we're experiencing. And partly that's about all departments in the council looking at their role and the contribution that they can make. It's about the council also looking at their existing policies and going, what's stopping this stuff working? But the, the declaration has also acted like a banner. It's about calling more partners to the table as well as getting existing partners to do more. So, for example, the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce was one of the first organisations that said, OK, we're here to help. And the MOD as well, you know, actually just offering properties up to the council going, here you go, you know, back to that thing about empty properties. So I, I don't think there's any silver bullets to any of this, but I think certainly Edinburgh is an interesting example of having made a good start. Now, we've got 10 local authorities that have declared so far, and not all of them have um, developed or published their housing emergency action plan, so it's quite early to tell what, what does that look like overall, and what also do those plans tell us about what central government needs to do. And I think it is about all layers of government. I mean, we were quite vocal during the UK general election campaign about what we wanted Westminster parties to, to be looking at, as well as here in Holyrood and also local authorities. It has to be all levels. So it's, it's early days, but I think certainly when you look at Argyll and Butte, when you look at Edinburgh, I think there's some interesting lessons emerging from what those local authorities are doing. Um, the proof will be in the pudding. Let's see what results we get from that. You, you, you presumably think there needs to be a response from the Scottish Government as well, not just individual councils. In the same way that I've, I, I've said to the gentleman there that you know declaring a housing emergency is an important first step for a local authority, it's the same with the Scottish Parliament. They've declared a housing emergency several weeks later. Now, OK, early days, and we've had the small matter of a UK general election. But we're not hearing anything about a commitment to a housing emergency action plan. How do they express the priorities and the imperative so that local authorities and other partners understand, geez, this is what we've got to do. This is this is important stuff. I need to double down on this. That's what we're not getting at the moment. Yeah. Okay. No, you think you were first? You were first. <laughs> then I'll come to you. I think we all agree the answer is we need more houses and yet there seems to be no limit on the number of private developments you see them all around Edinburgh I'm from Fife and they're all around St Andrews I mean why do we not insist as part of the planning consent that more houses are given over for, for social renting would you say I mean I've got I've certainly got experience of where you will have new developments built and some of those developments will be social housing you just don't know about it because they all look the same is that a fair comment yeah i mean i think i think you know there are regulations in terms of permitted development in terms of the percentage of any new development that that needs to be social housing and i think it's a really interesting example here in edinburgh on leith walk um, from places but for people, a, a housing association, and it's a mixture of private and social. And, and you, you know, there's not a big banner up saying this is the social bit. I think I think that's kind of interest. I mean, I think Ken, you're probably a much better place to talk about. You know, well, well how is that actually translating through, and, and what, you know, because we have done a fairly wholesale review of our planning system in Scotland. Are we seeing what we need to see in terms of creating imperative for 
for, for more of that to be social. I mean, for more of it to be social, there needs to be investment. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm not a planner, but I mean, it, it is the case that we have more permissive laws in Scotland than in England now. So we have Section 75, which they would call, you would call Section 106, where, where a quota beyond a certain size, there's a case made for some kind of affordable housing. Uh, less and less of it seems to be social these days. Uh, it's often uh, affordable, uh, etc. But there are some interesting things. So again, Edinburgh, they are actually trying to encourage the where student housing is being built, purpose-built student accommodation in the city. They want there to be some some affordable housing provision uh, given with with the, the planning permission that gets uh, granted. And I think the Scottish government thinks that whatever happens with ways to try to build more social and affordable housing. These Section 75 agreements for planning gain will be part of that, and, and that seems to be the, uh, the uh, belief. But I couldn't tell you the, the numbers that they contribute. But in a context where it's increasingly harder to build with the grant levels that are available, and the grant levels are much deeper here than they are in England. We get much deeper grants per unit, but the, 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 the quantum has shrunk of the, of the, of, 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 of the programme. So that's partly why we're... We're seeing approvals and starts go 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 go, go down, but uh, that that planning game thing—it's a small but important part of the story, and I think everybody thinks it will be in the future as well. Do you have an indication of who might have a question? Lots, right? Uh, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five. Right, right. Quick fire, okay? You get no speeches. Just be brief and we'll get through it. Okay, you're first. Not so much a question, I've just got a point I want to make. Um, in the 1980s in Liverpool, a council stood up against Thatcher's um, austerity and they um, won millions back for that city and they s cleared the slums and they built m um, loads of new, good quality uh, council houses. Um, austerity is a political choice. There's plenty of money in society, more than enough, and it's a political choice that any of these politicians in this parliament today could make the decision to pass a, a no cuts budgets, and it would so go a huge way to solving uh, this housing crisis. It's an absolute disgrace that we are allowing profit to be put into, the, into um, people's houses. Uh, and, it, and it's easily solved, but it's a political choice. And you've got MPs and MSPs serving in this building who are landlords, and they'll never make that choice. So. Not me. <laughs> right. Um, what, what I'm going to do is I'll get, th I'll get through everyone, and if you can just latch on to something that you've heard and respond at the end. Right. Hands up. Um, okay, we'll go over here just to make life awkward for you. but was stuck in a queue at security because he was right behind me. I'm just going to stand up for you there. Yeah. <laughs> you were on time. Um, I don't know if this is a fair question or not, but Neil Mackay wrote a few weeks ago now that the rise of the far right in Scotland and in England was down predominantly to the shortage of affordable and social homes. To what extent do you agree or disagree with that sentiment? Okay, interesting. Right, who's next? Um, yes, this gentleman just behind you. Pass it back. Uh, Alison said early on that one solution was for the social housing to be increased by local authorities buying houses on the open market. And indeed in Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh encourages uh, private investors to buy flats and lease them to the council for uh, homeless, solving homeless people. But what worries me about this is that if somebody else is buying in an existing market, it will put prices up and it's going to take away properties from people that were going to buy a home to live in. And it, doesn't seem, it seems to be a bit sort of circular to me. Okay, hands up. Yes. Um, 
you've painted quite a, a, a dark picture, or at least it looks like quite a dire uh, situation you find yourselves in. I wondered whether there were um, places, either at local um, or national level, um, elsewhere in the world that you think are actually striking the right balance and could be providing us with a, a model. Good question. International examples. Uh, chap in a t-shirt. Um, you've all mentioned the different extents, I think particularly yourself, Guizhou, about the kind of perception of social housing um, seen quite negatively nowadays. Um, I've done, i doing my PhD research on homelessness and housing, and one thing that's come up is the kind of the attitude towards landlords versus tenants' rights, and they seem to be put kind of, as you were saying earlier on, that there needs to be a balance, but does that balance need to be 50 50? Um, and how, how do we go about changing the attitudes around housing? Okay, and then along the route. Um, I, actually, it's very close to what you've just said. Um, just back to the word of stigma that was used earlier and it's only been brought up once. Um, but actually, I did my dissertation research on not the stigma of the people living in social housing, but the pressure that we've put on sort of young people and people in this country to get onto the property ladder, like you go up the property ladder as if your success is defined by the house you own and the size of it. And I think that goes hand in hand actually with the fact that there is a negative image. And just to add, I think in planning there should be a 25% um, social housing in any new developments. And if not, there should be a fee that that development has to pay to the Scottish Government. Just wanted to add that. Good. Right. Have I missed anyone? Right. We got through them all. Okay. We'll start with you and we'll work our way along. So super quick. Is it about political choices? Yes. Um, in terms of the rise of the far right and, and the extent to which that is feeding off myths about housing, I, I think Neil makes some really interesting points. Um, I got a couple of mates who live in the Netherlands. I was over there in March and they're particularly concerned about housing shortages in the Netherlands being used as a, a feeding ground for the far right. And, and we do see some of that in Scotland and we've got to be prepared to deal with that scapegoating because immigrants and asylum seekers are not causing Scotland's housing emergency. A lack of social housing is what's causing Scotland's housing emergency. So I think we, we, I think we need to be alive to that, particularly in terms of the, the riots that we've seen in England and, and in Belfast. In terms of acquisition, I mean, I think in terms of the impact on the private market, some of that is probably for me about, I don't think we've got the balance right, you know, that the conversation we were having earlier, I think we have arrived at a situation where home ownership is seen as the thing that we should all be aspiring to. And, and I grew up in social housing, there was no stigma um, attached to people like myself who lived in social housing at the time. And I also think acquisition may have a role for a period of time clear the decks, deal with the housing emergency, and then we do a reset. So you know, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily share your concern that it impacts on the, on the private market. I think in terms of examples, I mean, you mentioned Vienna, Austria is a really interesting example. Something like 70% of the population in Austria live in some form of social housing, and they've had a strong commitment to social housing since before the First World War. So they're doing something right. And it really means also that there's more money circulating in their economy because people are spending less on their housing costs. So it's, it's some interesting examples there. And I think in terms of that bit about perception, absolutely. As I say, I grew up in social housing. I don't remember being stigmatised. We have allowed social housing to become a residual housing choice and we need to tackle that. And I absolutely agree about pressure to buy. Why have we allowed ourselves to become obsessed by home ownership? And it's back to your points about allowing it to be a commodity rather than a basic human right. So that's my rattle through. Okay. Okay. Uh, you don't, you don't have to cover everything. Now. I won't cover everything. Uh, so uh, I think there's all this interesting things going on elsewhere that we can draw lessons from, but we need to draw them judiciously in the sense that they come from different histories, different contexts, different institutions, different market environments, different cultures about, about housing, and we can't automatically transfer the one to the other. But sometimes these things are really interesting. Austria is the absolute poster boy of international comparisons around, around the world. And actually, just to go against my own argument, the Republic of Ireland has recently introduced their cost-renting model, which is a form of affordable re rental housing. It's too early to see how successful is, but they're really 
committed uh, to it, which is, which is something of interest. So it's, it's, that gets us, do we want to have affordable rented housing, do we want to have social rented housing kind, kind of debates. The really interesting thing, I think, is about the political choices around and the austerity kind, kind of issues. There's been some brilliant work recently done by to Toby Lloyd, who used to be Shelter Policy Advisor, used to be David Cameron's Policy Advisor, actually. He is basically saying that how we need an investment state, we need to invest in housing and social housing, and we need to change, make political decisions to change the rules by which government obsesses about fiscal rules, about debt levels, and about uh, b b b b borrowing rules. He says we should go back to what Gordon Brown called the golden rule, where you could you could basically have unlimited capital expenditure in theory, provided uh, you covered all your current expenditure. That was kind of the kind of rule. So to be more investment in favour. And critically, Britain, unlike most European countries, has a public accounting rule. So it's getting really nerdy. Public accounting rule, which essentially uh, says that local authorities investing in council housing counts as capital expenditure in, in, in Britain. Most other European countries, public corporations, including local authorities, their investments don't count as public expenditure. And in fact, there's a really simple argument about this in housing. Every house that a council builds literally gets paid off in rent. The debt is covered by rent. So there's an internal transaction there. And you don't need to do it. We should be investing much more in our housing. Uh, we should have a much stronger commitment towards investment for all these economic and social reasons we've, we've heard about. And it's just a political choice to change some of the rules of the game, which reduces the power of the Treasury and, and changes the public rules, which also affect how Scotland does out the Barnet formula and all of those things. These are political choices. There's nothing set in stone about them at all. Pleasure, you to finish up. <laughs> yes, um, all of those questions were really great. I unfortunately have a memory of a goldfish, so I can remember about two. <laughs> Um, stigma and attitudes, what I'd like to see actually, in fact, and I didn't mention it earlier, was um, government taking a more um, proactive approach um, when it comes to trying to tackle this issue around stigma and social housing and actually stepping forward themselves and showing why social housing is positive, why this is a benefit, the benefit to the lives of ordinary individuals up and down the country who are living in social housing, who will live in social housing, and who have grown up and lived in social housing, and just the impact it's had and the opportunities that it's provided them. I think ultimately that's how it starts, and I think things have become so bad and so deep-rooted when it comes to the poor and negative stigma around social housing and those living in it that ultimately I think the only change can be brought around and the quickest change can only be brought around by government and immediate government because even some of the things that I still hear now three years into campaigning about those living in social housing or what they do, what they don't do, the type of people that they are, um, a lot of the time it's, it's deep-rooted in ignorance, unfortunately, and that's not something that's going to disappear overnight. So that's certainly something that I would like to see and that has to change because ultimately that is how we fix this housing crisis. Um, social housing is the foundation of this social housing crisis and you cannot build a house on broken foundations. You cannot fix this crisis on broken foundations. So we have to repair social housing and work our way up um, accordingly. In relation to um, your question in, in, in regards to tenant like landlord relationship, um, as the gentleman said earlier on, um, in regards to being a landlord too, in, in there are and there are acknowledgement or there is acknowledgement out there that unfortunately there are um, what, what we call rogue landlords within the private rent, rented sector, and it is creating um, the, this. I don't know what the saying is, but tarnishing or paintbrush of what all private landlords are like. And unfortunately, like I mentioned earlier, one in four homes in England, uh, probably be different up here in Scotland, doesn't meet the current decent home standard. I mean, some of the private homes have been in, uh, been absolutely diabolical. I mean, there have been news stories down in England where people have died as a result of the conditions that they um, have been living in. And ultimately, I can accept that that, that is unacceptable. That cannot ever be justified, and they should not be allowed to operate within that sector. And I've spoken myself to landlords who say the same. And I think if we're certainly in agreement there, then perhaps that's one way of moving forward, is to try and make sure that those who are perhaps exploiting the sector in the wrong way, risking people's lives, um, 
risking the reputations of others within the sector, that if we can agree that they shouldn't exist, that, that, that that's perhaps some, an area that should be pursued, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I've got some boring stuff I have to read out. Um, actually, the not boring bit is, don't forget, we've got Quajo's, Quajo's book, Our Country in Crisis, Britain's Housing Emergency and How We Re Rebuild. If you buy that, he'll sign it for you. That might make it worth a bit more. I don't know. <laughs> get it, get it on eBay. You never, you never know. Might make, might turn a profit. You never know. Um, but it is a good book. I've read it. It is worth, uh, it is worth a read. And I don't think I've spoiled it too much. There's a lot more. There's a lot more uh, in there. Um, Ken's also got a book coming out next year, all about council tax. Um, have to. <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's um, Christmas 2025. So have you got, so have got any relative, <laughs> any any relatives you're not, not keen on? Um, that's uh, that's what to go for. Um, I've also um, oh I should I, sorry I'm waffling here. Um, Ken Ken is a Motherwell fan. Um, and he was very excited to discover that Quajo's brother once played for Motherwell. So there you go. <laughs> small world. Um, small world, isn't it? Um, I'll also have to remind everyone to fill in the survey that you'll get automatically if you booked via Eventbrite. Uh, or there's a few paper copies at the back of the venue. Are there paper copies at the back of the venue? Yes. Yes. <laughs> We would appreciate your thoughts on how to improve the festival. So if you think the chair has been crap, <laughs> keep those thoughts to yourself. Um, can I take the opportunity to remind you that there are, this, this is fascinating, many more festival events taking place until Friday. These include a discussion about the what? power of the arts to reconnect people in place. Very true and displacement. That's at 5.30 today, so if you want to hang around for that. In the coming week, we've got discussions on everything from uh, jobs and the just transition to sexism in the workplace and AI and deep fake politics. A lot of fake politics around, isn't there? Um, I've had fun. I hope you've had fun. Can we thank our panellists, uh, Alison, Ken and Quazo. free to go. <laughs> Good.